Unreal Engine 4.20 gives us a large amount of features. Some of them are smaller features, so I thought I'd cover a few of them here today. So let's jump right into this. One of the first ones is asset metadata can now be imported with FBX files. So we have our rocks FBX that I've imported. If you right click on it, asset actions, show metadata, any of the metadata exported from your content creation program will now show up in here. And you can use this for things like maybe identifying what it might be used for, hints for your designers, any information you want to store inside of your FBX metadata will be imported when you import the FBX. The next thing is the ability to retarget animations easily. So if we pull up one of our animations, let's go ahead and find that right here. So here is my third person character, here's my skeleton, and here is my animation retargeting system, my retarget manager. Now let's say we wanted to retarget this, so let's go ahead and clear it out. We have nothing in here. Default is a humanoid rig, and you can see we have the settings right here. We have, it tries its best, root, pelvis, spine, following the basic setup of the skeleton. And if we auto map, it'll try its best as well. Well, let's say, for example, we didn't want that. Let's say our humanoid didn't have hands, and we didn't want the hand to map. Well, you now have the ability to save and load those targets. So, for example, if I click load, you can see I have a humanoid bone remapping set up. And if I choose it, you'll see it sets it up how I want it, and my hands have none for both sides because that's the way I designed it. So let's clear this out. Let's go ahead and clear this. We could do something like a humanoid. You design this exactly like you want it, set up whatever matches to whatever matches. I mean, I'm just going to go through and randomly click stuff. And once you're happy with that, save it, name it whatever you want, and then you'll have that available inside of your browser for future use to remap one skeleton to another easily without having to do it by hand. Our next thing is our materials can now show the platform stats all at once. So let's open up my materials here, and this is just a basic material, and I have a switch on here so I can show you the example. Right now we can see our instructions, the accounts, the samplers, blah, 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 everything for Shader Model 5, which is what I'm using. However, I want to see it for Android or iOS or Shader Model 4 or Vulkan or Low or High. I'm not going to see that information easily. Well, with 4.20, we can go to Window. Platform stats, and now it's going to show us the stats for any platforms we've chosen. Well, there's a few things to note here. First of all, I've chosen a lot of them. You can see I have my PC, DirectX. I have my Android, different types, GLES 3.1 and Vulkan. We can see some errors up here. We need an offline compiler. And we can see some values. To set the values you want to see, click on Settings and simply choose the ones you want. So in this case, I can undo Android and Vulkan. And now it's just going to show the PC. You also have the global quality settings, so I can see low, medium, or high. So if I undid low and medium, now I only see the high. But let's go back to low and go back to medium. Usually the first time you do this, it will have to recompile those shaders for those targets. Keep that in mind. You'll notice I have a switch here. I'm just simply using a color instead of a texture. We can see it here. We can see that I'm only using three samplers for my low and less pixel shader counts, and less first text shaders. So we can see it's accurate. When you go to iOS, well, it's not going to work because I don't have iOS as a valid target inside of my editor. If we were to go back to my editor, go to my options for 4.20, you can see down here, I don't have iOS as a valid target platform, therefore it's not going to show up as a valid in the pixel shader, in the shader compilers. So keep that in mind if you're having an issue, you may not be able to see it, you may not have that supported platform. For Android, let's go back to GLES, you'll notice it says it needs an offline shader to compile the exact construction count, and it tells you. Editor Preferences, Content Editor, Material Editor. So if we go up to Editor Preferences, our Content Editor is here, our Material Editor is here. You can see it needs the Molly offline compiler. It tells you where to go. Go ahead and download that, install it, set it up. Once it's done, you'll then get your Android compilation working fine. The next thing is going to be our Material Curve Atlases. So let's close these down. What is a Material Curve Atlas? Well, what is a ma well, what's a Material Curve or what's a Linear Color Curve? Well, we have a color curve. So, for example, if we were to go into our miscellaneous and we did a curve, we get a curve. So let's go with the Curve Linear Color. Open this up. And this is a curve. We can have different points on here. We can have different colors. And we get a colorful curve, like a gradient curve. 
When you're using that inside of your engine, inside of your material editor, for example, you get access to that one color curve. Well, the Atlas allows us to have access to multiple linear color curves. You can create them by right clicking, going to miscellaneous, and you have the curve atlas. What you end up with is this. You can add or remove multiple items in here. So for example, let me undo that and hopefully, it, there we go. You can add more or delete individual curves. And this basically gives you access to all of them. You can change the text or size and a few other options. These are all detailed in more detail in the documentation. But suffice it to say, I now have access to these three linear curves inside of one atlas. Now to use it, well, here's my material with my color curve. We have a node called color curve. We could type in, well, actually, let's just type in curve. It's easier. And you'll get down here, parameters, curve atlas row parameter. That's this. It's a parameter, which means it's exposed to our material instances. You set up your default curve you want to use inside of there, as well as the atlas you want to use, and then compile it out. I've named it color curve. We'll close that down. We'll look at our material. So here's our material instance. You'll notice I have access to a color curve parameter now. I can turn on and off. And I can now change to the different curves and easily change what my material is going to look like at runtime using a color curve. So it's a great way to adjust. Well, it's a color curve. If you've used color curves before, it's a great way to adjust it at once. You could do a scene. You could have different looks for your materials, maybe daytime, nighttime, dusk, special events, and easily change it in one set spot. Now, our next things aren't going to really be inside the engine. These are going to be more documentation things. These are things that aren't really shown easily inside the engine. So the first one is our mesh description, mesh format. Basically, on Epic, it's changing the way that meshes, static meshes and, and skeletal in the future, are represented internally. So the way after you import it, it stores it. It's going to try to have more information stored. So like you can see here, it's going to allow it to expose it to other APIs so you can actually modify them at runtime. In the future, for example, there may be a full mesh editing system in the engine. But so you can do things like you have better edges, you have quads and edges, and hardnesses are stored. The point of this is they're making it better for the future. You may see something weird with static meshes, but more than likely you won't. They're going to roll this out over time. It's just affecting static meshes in 4.20. Now our next stuff is our garbage collection improvements. Not something you can really show easily. Basically, garbage collection is in the background, primarily for your C++. When things are destroyed or removed and free up memory, sometimes it could take up to 60 seconds. Sometimes, depending on how many items you're deleting or removing all at once, it could slow down your computer. It's a hitch. You'll see it if, for example, you're doing something all of a sudden for no reason, your project slows down temporarily. A lot of the time, that's a garbage collection firing off and getting rid of unused things. Well, they've made it now multi-threaded and optimized, so it could be up to 13 times faster. And they've done a few other things. Basically, under the hood, less hitches. Next thing, Visual Studio 2017 is officially supported and works fine for editing inside the engine and compiling. The biggest changes there, let me pull up the Visual Studio installer, is you will need Visual Studio 2017, obviously, and Windows 10 SDK is what's used. So I'm modifying this. Desktop development C++ is what you'll need because you need the C++ toolchain. In addition, if you go to your individual components, you're going to want to make sure you have one of the Windows 10 SDKs installed. This is a fresh install of Visual Studio. I do not have 2015 installed. And you'll notice I don't have the 8.1 SDK installed, which is what was required before. And I've gone ahead and I've already compiled the engine without any issue. So you have to make sure you have your C++ toolchain running and you have the Windows 10 SDK. If you run into an error that, for example, it says, and where is it at? Uh, Windows Universal CRT not installed or not supported. That's a false flag. You'll notice I don't have it installed. That's actually an issue because you don't have the Windows 10 SDK installed. So keep that in mind. Even if you've been using Visual Studio 2017 up to this point without an issue, you need the Windows 10 SDK installed or you're going to have a bad time. Our last item is going to be development streams are now available to end users. So inside of the GitHub, you have access to all the releases. Now we also have access to the dev releases. So these are things that are working on that aren't quite ready for mainstream, like the new geometry mesh editing system, Niagara, when it was in development, 
sequencer system, the VR editor. These are things that they start working on for changes that aren't quite ready. But if you want to test them out, you can always branch or clone one of the developer branches, and you now have access to that new stuff in real time. And that's it. Those are just a few of the smaller changes in Unreal Engine 4.20 that I thought you should know about.